predestination is our subject for Sunday morning, has been for some time. And people say, isn't that limiting uh, subject for Sunday morning? No, predestination covers every subject in the Bible, from Christmas, Christ's Mass, uh, to prophecy, to gematria, to the organization of numbers in the Bible. Predestination covers everything because predestination <clears throat> is about everything that's righteous and what God has to do to cause us be willing to be righteous. Predestination is either true or it isn't. And it is true, and it has a definition to it. But people don't like it. I got to thinking this past few days, what kind of people do not like predestination? And I sat down and wrote some things about people who don't like it. <clears throat> Successful people in the world who are professionals, professionals in some kind of business, if it's a business owner or if it's uh, uh, a doctor or lawyer, these people don't like it because if you believe in predestination, you have to embrace it and do it because predestination is something we do. It's not something you mentally assent to. Uh, I've talked to many doctors. I'm going to tell you who, how doctors are, doctors and lawyers. If they're very intelligent, they listen to you. And being educated men, and some of them being educators, educators recognize information when they hear it. And the doctors I've talked to, I've talked to a dozen doctors, preached it to them. And they'll sit there and in amazement look at you and ask questions and then walk away and forget about it. They know what you're saying is informative and that it is true because it has information involved in it. And they recognize that. But they also know, like I told a dentist here in town, I told Billy, I said, Billy, you cannot listen to what I'm teaching and you cannot afford to embrace it. Because if you do you're going to lose 65% of your clientele because come Christmas time, you're going to say, I don't do Christmas, and they're going to think you became a heathen. You don't believe in Jesus anymore. You don't believe in God. You don't believe in salvation. If you believe in, in that Christmas is pagan, people say, oh, you don't believe in Jesus. No, the reason we don't believe in Christmas is because we do believe in Jesus, the real Jesus of the Bible and Christmas is the Roman Catholic Jesus is Christ's Mass. Now, let me continue reading some of these things about the people. What kind of people do not like predestination? The doctrines we preach on predestination and Christmas will cause men to lose business. They know that. If they actually believe it, they cannot afford to express it and embrace it to their people. They'll be asked, why don't you have Christmas decorations up? And What do you mean God doesn't love everybody? Why, our church believes that. I thought you were a decent doctor or a decent lawyer. We thought you were a Christian man. Only God knows how many people would leave the churches of these preachers if they told the truth about predestination and Christmas. Their offerings would come to very small end. Business professionals would lose a majority of their clients. But you know, pride and anger would be a common denominator in this message. Men will not believe because of their pride in their family beliefs, what their mother told them, what their father told them. And they're proud of that, and it angers them to think that you're going to put down their mother and their father and their brothers and their sisters, and particularly an old grandfather who was a preacher. They are angry when America says God is love. When they, they say God is love, he loves everybody, and we say God does not love everybody, and that angers them because they're proud of the fact that they believe what most people in America believe. Young people in the world do not want this truth. They're seeking the opposite sex, or some of them are seeking the same sex. Money, future, 
career, houses, lands, possessions, even the young elector seeking that. They got too many juices flowing in their body, and they just can't give it up yet. Have you? Ever, has everybody here noticed how few teenagers come to Grace and Truth? Have you noticed how few people in their 20s come here? And have you noticed how hard it is for people in their 30s to live in this? Even in their 40s and 50s, it's a hard message for us. Preachers do not want it. They'll lose most of their congregation. They'll lose their salary, their housing allowance, their car allowance. People in general don't want it, and they don't want to lose their family and friends and position. You can't have this without talking about it. It is costly, isn't it? It's going to cost you friends. It's going to cost you family. And God has to deal with your heart to a point where you're willing to say, I want God's truth over my family, my friends, my job. And I'm not... There is a way to deal with this doctrine when you're on a job. You don't go on your job and steal from your boss by stopping working and preaching to somebody. If you can talk to someone, fine. But if you have to cause trouble for the company you're working for, keep your mouth shut. But on your breaks, when you're off break, or even if somebody else brings it up, Tell people what you think, but don't try to force it on them. You should never try to force these truths on anybody. I don't ever try to do that. I only talk to people who are wanting to talk. If they're wanting to start a fight, I say, excuse me, I don't have time for that. I want you to look over here and see the cost that it cost in Luke, the 14th chapter. Luke will tell you what it takes to learn. Luke 14. This is a, a uh, exposition by Christ, and it's about a man uh, having a supper for his kinsmen and his friends, and they all come up and they make excuse. Now, everyone has an excuse why they don't want to believe this doctrine of predestination. Now, you find some of the most ridiculous excuses here in this 14th chapter. In verse 15, And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Bread, of course, would be the word of God is the living bread. And when one of the, uh, then said he unto them, a certain man made a great supper and bade many to come. And of course, remember that uh, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And nomos is the Greek word law, and it means legally prescribed food for animals, and we are sheep, legally prescribed. It's what God prescribes for his people. And that is nomos, the Greek word law. It means food for sheep. Well, that's us. So when it's talking about bread, you're still talking about the same thing. And sent his servant at supper time to say unto them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The word is paratomeomai. It means to reject or decline the offer for the food. Well, they declined it because God didn't write it in their hearts. It wasn't by their own free will. It was by their self-will. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I have to go and see it, and I pray thee have me excused. Uh, the first one said, I've got to go out and check out my new house on uh, on Sunday, and I've, I've got to mow my grass on Sunday morning, so I don't have time, Jim. I'm real tired, and I work hard during the week, and uh, I deserve some time off, and that's my excuse. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and go to prove them, and I pray thee, have me excuse. I've got to work in my flower bed, or I've got to go plow my field or, or my garden uh, on Sunday because I have a long, hard job. 
And another said, I have married a wife and she won't let me come and she's got me doing all of these honeydews on Sunday, do this and do this, honey. And so I don't have time. Here's the excuses. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go put quickly, go out quickly into the streets and and the lanes of the city and bring in the hither the poor, the maimed, the halt, the blind, the brokenhearted, and the bruised, the poor in spirit. Poor. P-T-O-C-H-O-S. It means emptied out. Go out and get the emptied out because Jesus said, this is who I came to and these are my elect people. Now you can be literally poor and not poor in spirit. You can be real proud about how much you can drink. You can go down here and find a wino down on Broadway and they're proud that they can drink more than the guy next to them. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. Uh, he's not talking about compelling the people that rejected it and made excuse. He's talking about compel. Anangke is the word A-N-A-G-K-E. We get the word ankle from that. An ankle is the bending of the foot uh, there at the ankle. So he's saying, compel the elect to come in, and they will come in. For I say unto you that none of these men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. The call goes out to many. Many are called there in Matthew, the 20th chapter, but few are chosen. And the word chosen is E-K-L-E-K-T-O-S. Eklektos, that's the word elect. Few are favored. We are favored and a synonym for elect is the word grace. Grace is the word charis. Grace is the word charis. It means unmerited favor. I'll get it right in a minute. C-H-A-R-I-S. That means favor that is unmerited. So elect is favored. And that's something that God does among his people that we cannot have any answer for. Maybe in time God will let us see that. And any man, he says, And there went a multitude with him, and he turned and said unto them. Now he's still in the same subject. He says, if any man come to me and hate not his father and his mother and his wife and children and brethren and sisters, and notice the next thing he says, yea, and his own life also. He's talking about the life of people who make excuse and live outside the kingdom of God are not interested in truth. They're not interested because God hasn't made them interested. He cannot be my disciple. He's talking about these people who make excuse and the people you run into every day. If you hate somebody, does that mean you're going to treat them nasty? No. What you hate in them is there's no Christ in them. There's no truth written in their heart, and only God can write that truth in their heart. You can't write that yourself. If he doesn't write his word in your heart, you can't come. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So if you don't hate your mother, father, sister, brother, and yourself also, you cannot be a mathetes, M-A-T-H-E-T-E-S. We get our word mathematics from that, mathetes. This was around long before the word math was here. This is an old ancient Greek word. It means a learner. And when you take mathematics, you got all of these math laws. You have laws for learning. You have subjects and predicates and verbs and adjectives and pronouns. Now, some people don't like it that I bring up these parts of speech and say, well, 
well, you can't bring up those parts of speech. It, it loses the, the spiritual meaning. That's ridiculous. Adjectives were here and adverbs were here long before the English language was invented and created. Adjectives and adverbs and nouns and pronouns and participles were here in the Greek language. That's the whole idea. Whenever you look up a word in your interlinear Bible, don't pay any attention to the English in it. The English is wrong. You've got the, the, the Greek on the top line, and right under that, you've got the English. I don't even trust that English that's below the words. I go to the word, and in the English language, I try to explain to you what that word actually means. Now, what you have to do, you have to take that word exactly how it's spelled in the interlinear Bible. I've said this before. And I'll say it again. Maybe this will help you to understand. When Mr. Strong gives you a word, he only gives you, you got, you got singular, plural, masculine and feminine, neuter, gender under the singular, masculine and feminine, neuter, gender under the plural, and then you have the cases, nominative, genitive, dative, and accusative case. So you got all these different ways to spell one word, and depending on where it is in the sentence, it's going to be determined what the spelling is. When you look up a word in Strong's Concordance, all Mr. Strong gives you is nominative case, masculine gender, and singular. That's all he gives you. If it's, if it's uh, feminine gender in the dative case, which is the indirect object, the only way you're going to be able to find that out is look up the spelling, not of the English word, Use the English word to locate the Greek word and then put that Greek word down and get, your, get a uh, uh, parsing guide. I got one up here. Here's one. And you look up that word in the Greek, but you can't do it unless you learn your Greek alphabet. And don't, don't, don't try to memorize the caps, capitals. The uppercase, memorize the lowercase. Memorize these right here, and that's what it'll be written in. And then you look that up in your, your, your parsing guide, and it'll tell you the part of speech. It'll actually tell you the spelling will be different. If you have the word the, the, I use that because it's simple, in and Mr. Strong doesn't give you a good understanding of the word. Uh, in fact, when you look up whosoever in Mr. Strong, it's really, not, it's really wrong. It's not wrong, it's just not right. <laughs> because he puts ho, hey, to. That's the word the, nominative case, masculine and singular, is ho. Nominative case singular feminine is hey. And nominative singular neuter is to. Each one of those words is the word the in the Greek. But you're not going to know that unless you look it up in here. And then look at this. And a lot of times they're leaving. It's like John 3.16, of course, it doesn't say what people think it says. But when it says, God so loved the world, it doesn't say for God. God so loved. It says for, for the ho. For the God so loved. Well, of course, it doesn't say so. It says so, but it says huto. It says the God. And they leave the definite article the out in the King James Bible. Well, why would they do that? I don't know why they did it, because for the God means there's only one God, right? But you're going to have to learn to look at your interlinear Bible and recognize the words. Now, I don't know how I got off on that. Let's get back to this subject here. So, to be a disciple. We're talking about a disciple. To be a learner, you're going to have to... You don't have to learn the Greek. You don't, have to, you don't have to learn the Greek, but it's good to learn how to look these things up. 
maybe we can have a class one day and I'll show you how to look things up. It's not hard at all. Now, let's get back to this. So you have to hate mother, father, sister, brother. In order to believe predestination and Christmas is pagan, it is the truth. You have to hate mother, father, sister, brother, and all of their beliefs, and hate your own beliefs, and then you have to embrace the truth. Predestination is truth. And if you do not bear your cross, now where do you get a cross? Whosoever doth not bear, not Jesus' cross, your own cross. Everyone was bearing crosses. But that was a common phrase in the days of the first century. And even the century before, two or three centuries before Christ, it was a common phrase to bear your cross, to undergo uh, difficulties in life. That's because crosses were used for hundreds of years prior to Christ to cause criminals to be put to death. And the Romans honed that to a really fine skill uh, to cause a man to stay on a cross for many days. And then he says, For which of you... Now, it takes a lot to take your cross. You have to be condemned to a cross. You have to be condemned to a cross for telling the truth by the world. It's the world that's going to crucify us on our cross. And if you'll notice, if you'll, it's not there. Whosoever is not there. There's no such word as whosoever in the Greek language. Every time you look up the word whosoever, you've got to look in, in your interlinear Bible and see what it is. Sometimes... It will just, John 3.16 says, doesn't say whosoever. The word whosoever is an English word, and there's no such word in the Greek language. It's not whoever wants to. That's, that's what that implies. Usually it'll be ho. Ho. It'll be some form of ho or the. The. The pos. The all. And it'll be talking about the particular all. The is a, is a definite article. It means there's no other all involved in this. And the is singular. And all is singular. And what is the all? The all is, is the sheep. How do sheep, if you have a whole bunch of sheep, how can they be one all? They will be one flock, won't they? And that would be singular. So usually it'll be some form of ho pos or pos ho, the way they would put all the, and that's just simply talking about all the sheep of the flock. That's usually what the word whosoever, it's some form of the and all. It's never whosoever. There's no such word in the Greek. That's really a bad, bad translation. Then he says in verse 28, now what we've been talking about, who are these people and why is it they don't like predestination? Well, it costs. For which of you, verse 28, intend to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost. It's going to take a daily cross. It's going to take hating your mother, father, sister, brother, and you're going to have to take a second look at yourself and say, I'm sick and tired of my opinions. I'm going to believe if the Bible says whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. I'm going to find out what that means by defining these words in the Greek. It has a definition. And if you'll notice, people don't care what the definition is. They are going to ignore it if they don't like it. And that word count, you have to count the cost. P-S-C, P-H-I-Z-O. Pafidzo, pafidzo means to use pebbles to enumerate as a computer. They computed everything by counting pebbles. Not unlike the Chinese, uh, what do you call that? Abacus. Ab yeah, I, I, I've read it and I've forgotten what it was. But it's not unlike the same thing. They counted pebbles to count the cost of building a building. So what he's saying, he's talking about making excuses. 
he's talking about if you want to be a follower of Christ, you have to take a cross when men condemn you to your cross because Jesus, if you'll notice, Jesus gave the apostles their cross before he died on his cross, didn't he? He said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. Not Jesus' cross. Take up your own cross daily. <laughs> to which of you, in t he, oh, go to verse 29. Lest happily, after he hath laid the foundation. Now, the word foundation is themelios. T-H-E-M-E-L-I-O-S. T-H-E-M-E-L-E-I-O-S. And it is a derivative or a derivation of the word tithame. Now, tithame, that's in the Greek. Tithame means to lay out, lay out, or lay forth. And we've, used, we've shown that word is used in many, many different ways. When the Bible says God hath, a, hath not appointed us to wrath, the word appointed is the word tithame. It means to lay out like a track, like a destination. God has not appointed us to the orge. Orge is, is a word that means fury and rage and jealousy and, and, uh, and being angry over somebody beating you or hurting you or gossiping about you. We're not supposed to be involved in the orge. Well, thamelios is the word foundation. And when the Bible says laying a foundation, that's also, that would be a derivative of faith is the substance of things hoped for. Substance, this word substance is a very difficult word for these scholars to, let me say this slow so you can get a hold of this. For them to define. It's the word hypostasis. Now I have said before. It's a construction of hupo. And hupo is a word that means under. And stasis means to stand. Or to be upright. Now the Bible says there's none that understandeth. It means to stand. Stand. Now, there's none that understandeth. Now, how in the world can you just get that? You're not going to get that definition, but if you go into... Let me read some stuff to you out of the Kittle's Dictionary of New Testament Greek Words. Now, we think of something that has substance as something that's existing, and it is. But it, this is the broadness of the Greek language. It's very broad in understanding it. It means to undertake or to stand under, according to Kittles, to stand under as a support. Well, when you see something, he goes on to say, to place self under, to stand off from, to be or to exist. Now, that sounds strange. But when you see a building, the reason this building exists is because it has an understanding. And the reason it exists is it has an understanding. Another word for under is sub. A stand means to, is a structure. It's a substructure. And a substructure is a foundation. And when you have a foundation, you have an understanding. Faith is the foundation that we build on, that we add to our faith. When we add to our faith, and the Bible names seven things, when it names virtue and it names knowledge and temperance and patience and so forth, when it says we add to faith, we add to the foundation and our faith grows in the sense that there is a house built upon our faith.
faith. That's how faith is increased or added to. Paul speaks to the Thessalonians. He says, I pray that your faith will increase exceedingly. Increase exceedingly is the word hoop, hoop, axano. Hupaxano means to, to hypo is the word here, not, not hupo, but hypo. Uh, hypo, we think of hyping something or building it up. Well, hypaxano, axano is the common word for grow or increase. Well, the Bible says, speaks of uh, there in 2 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, uh, 10th chapter, verse 15, the Bible says, when your faith is increased, you'll begin to extol the words that I say, Paul says, and that word increase is the word axano. When Paul says in 1 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians, the first chapter, I believe it's verse 3, he says, when, he says, I pray your faith will grow exceedingly, grow exceedingly as hoop axano. So therefore, he's saying, I hope your faith will increase, increase, grow exceedingly. The way faith grows exceedingly is we add to our faith, and that's the foundation. Faith is the understanding. Let me read some more of this. It means to exist. If you see something that exists, it has a foundation. If you see a plank, this is the way they thought. It was very broad. If they said something existed, there was something behind the existence. If you see a jet flying through the air, it has a foundation. What is that foundation? Jet propulsion. They discovered that back in the 30s, and they've developed it. And the foundation, the fact that a jet can fly is jet propulsion or the yaw or the, of the ailerons. I've done a, what's the yaw and the, what's the other, Gary? Pitching, y'all. Yeah, I studied a little air science when I was in college. But what is behind that is the fact that they've known how to get airlift to a plane. It has a foundation. The foundation is what makes that thing stand there in front of you. There has to be a foundation. We don't think of things with the broadness. They considered existence and understanding interrelated well with one another. Let me just read a couple other things here to exist. Now, I'll underline some things in here. Uh, a constituent, here's a part of what they say it means. A constituent, part of the concept is that this is the part which can be seen. So when they thought about hypostasis, they're saying the part that can be seen is there because of the part that cannot be seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What we don't see, we can't see a man's faith. You can only see it as he builds the house of God. Which house are we, right? We are God's house. So as he builds this house, the word build is the same word as edify, Edify, isn't it amazing how you can start one part of the Bible and move into all these areas? Edify is the word oiko, O-I-K-O-D-O-M-E-O. -E Whenever you're looking at the word family or house, it'll be a form of oikos, O-I-K-O-S, or oikia, O-I-K-I-A. These are forms of family or house. And D-O-M-E looks like the word dome, and it is. But it's our word, roof. So a dome is the Greek word for roof, but it's pronounced dome. So oiko dome is, is uh, the word edify or build. Upon this rock I will build my church. Well, how, does, how is the house of God built? The Bible says faith worketh by Love. Now, faith, which is death to self, daily cross, self-denial, believing God, not believing self. Faith is dying daily to this flesh or this sinful desire that we have. And it works by agape. 
when the Bible says faith, no vain man that faith without works is dead, faith is, the word work of this E-N-E-R-G-E-O. It's our word energy. It means operation or operate. Faith operates. But you don't start off with a, work, with a lot of working faith. You start off with oligos, pistis. Oligos is the word puny, and pistis is the word faith. You start off with just a foundation, and you haven't built anything. So when you add to your faith, and your faith increases, you build the building of God, and you do that because God is working in you. You don't do that on your own, and you don't do it on your own works. God has to work in us to cause us to finish building the house of God. And there's an evidence, there's an evidence right here as we see the building of God that there's some be, something behind this and that is the reason we can see something solid in front of us. It has a foundation. Somebody has figured out how to pour a footing spiritually in our life, haven't they? God has done that in our lives. But let me read a couple other things here. Make it likely that hypostasis was used in everyday speech. It was used in everyday speech in the 4th century B.C. It was the scientific use which formed the starting of. What we'll starts something? The foundation. Well, every time you find the word foundation, it comes from the word tithome, means to lay out. When Jesus said, no man takes from my life from me, I lay down my life. He used the word tithomai. And that is the foundation of our salvation, isn't it? Let me give you something else on this. It's, this is really interesting stuff. The verbal noun, hypostasis, only in the second sense of the verb, hypostasis is being which has attained reality. The only reason a building retains reality or a jet flies is because there was a foundation behind it, right? A foundation of anything. The foundation of salt. What's the foundation of salt? Sodium and chlorine. That's the foundation. You have the two coming together and you have salt because the foundation is what it's constructed of. It's the constituents. What it's made from which has come into existence. They say existence and foundation are interrelated and they cannot be separated. So if faith is the substance, the fact that we have understanding in our life, understanding is, I've said this so many times, understanding is what, our, what, fa what makes faith increase and what we build it upon or what God builds it upon in our lives. If you have an understanding, let me say this slow. If you have an aptitude for mathematics, you have an understanding for them. Well, you have the understanding before you go and take math, don't you? I didn't say you understood math, you have an understanding. The ability to understand is in you if you can study computers and learn it. You already have the understanding, but you don't understand. The understanding is the ability to go to a class and listen to the teacher and say, I understand that. I can see that. But if you don't have the aptitude for something, I do not have the aptitude for painting. Mary has an aptitude for painting. She can paint all these real pretty pictures. I can't do that. I do not have an understanding. I do not see how people can look at something and paint it and make it look like they look. I don't understand that. I can't perceive that. I've wanted to ask artists, what do you see? Do you see that thing? Do you see symmetry? Or what are you painting? I don't understand. I can't paint. That's the way it is. I see things in Scripture. Now, let me just continue on this. I really want you to understand what hypostasis under what substance means. Uh, he says that it's primal matter that's without form 
but primal matter always exists. And then he says, this shows plainly that hypostasis had come to denote the reality. It denotes reality. The foundation denotes what you see. Or when you see something in a person's life. What we do see in a person's life is God building the house of God in them, don't we? We don't see the faith until we see them doing the truth, right? The house being built is them doing the truth. You understand what I'm saying? And what and how it how is the house of God built? Well, we said faith worketh by love, and a, a love is agape, and agape edifies. Notice the connection here. Agape edifies. Agape is walking in the commandments of God that builds up the house of God and faith works by this agape. Faith works by love and love builds up the house of God. So faith, which is the foundation, works as God is building the house of God and that is by walking in the commandments of God. That's very abstract thinking, isn't it? But you have to come to understanding of that. Let me read a couple of more things he says about faith here. So the fact that something exists to the Greek mind meant it had a foundation. Really, that's true with us, isn't it? So that you can drive a car, there has to be an engine inside of it. The whole idea of a car is to get you somewhere, but not without an engine. The foundation of a car is that engine. Without it, you don't have a car. Now, you got a frame. That's all you got. Uh, hypostasis often is a political or military plan, and it's called a hypostasis. It's a plan or a program. This, that's why this word is so hard for a lot of people to understand. It is an understanding. When I say that, it's a foundation. I make it real simple, and I haven't ever brought this out to this degree. So, when we're talking about being a disciple and learning predestination, I've gotten off on something this morning I didn't even mean to get off on. And then he says here, Hypostasis denotes immovable property. Why is it immovable? Because it has a foundation. You say, how can a jet plane be immovable? Well, you can't move it into being a tree. It has a foundation. It operates on jet propulsion. And it's going to be that until... It quits having jet propulsion. But God's foundation is always the same foundation. You have to understand the Jews thought, the Greeks thought with great depth. We don't have the depth that they think. If they said foundation, they meant the existence of something that stood before them. They didn't mean a foundation with nothing on, above it. They connected the building with the foundation. Well, we should, shouldn't we? And then he goes on to say, it was something here I was going to, the foundation of life is with God. And he says, the word means a plan. Well, if there's a plan to something, there's a foundation behind it. Hypostasis, listen to this, is the underlying reality behind something. Now, that, the underlying reality behind something is its foundation in it. Faith is the foundation that we build on, and it has to grow. If it doesn't grow and it doesn't increase, then God's not working in you, and you don't belong to Him, and you don't have the foundation you thought. <clears throat> Let me see if there's something else. I underline these. I've had these copies with me for months and months and months been meaning to tell you about. So when you see the word substance, I'll show you something else on this in a minute. So we were talking about being a disciple, hating mother, father, sister, brother. <clears throat> you cannot build the house of God 
if you go by your opinions. If you say predestination is not true because your mama don't think so and your daddy don't think so, you have to hate mom and daddy and you have to hate your own opinions in order to understand you're going to build the house of God. That's the only way you can do it. You've got to get rid of everything that you ever thought and believe this book, period. Don't you? It don't matter what you find in it, <clears throat> but don't make some presumptions before you know something about it. Study a lot, and I've said this to people, I do not force square pegs and round holes. I do not try to make anything in the Bible fit. I study and study and study, and when it doesn't fit, I leave it alone until it brings itself together. Don't try to make... I have people come here. Jim's got all these profound things, and I want to be profound too, so I'm going to start pushing all these square pegs in these round holes. <clears throat> I'll punch holes in it if you do. <coughs> Eric did this when he was at home, <laughs> when he was a teenager. I'd be teaching, and he'd run downstairs. His bedroom was downstairs, and he'd run downstairs, and he'd, he'd come up with something. He'd come back upstairs, and he'd say, look what I found, and, and, and he'd have this great profound idea and I'd say you don't mind if I punch holes in that I'd go you'd go oh me <laughs> but you can't just make things fit because you want to be profound don't study that way study timelines people actions events notice their attitudes dates of things empires uh Read the Old Testament. Read everything as slow as you can and understand what you read. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do not read fast. You're never going to learn that way. There's no such thing as speed reading the Bible. It's like speed reading an algebra book. Yeah. That speed reading was a phase for a time, but that don't work. <clears throat> you don't learn anything that way. Let me read here a couple other things. Hupostas' passages primarily in this light, namely the much-quoted Hebrews 11 and 1, he goes on, on to say, whereas all patristic, which means fatherly, and medieval exegesis presuppose that hypostasis was to be translated substantia and understood the sense in Luther's translation introduced, let me see here, faith is now viewed as a personal subjective conviction. The interpretation is governed Protestant exposition of the passage almost completely. Let me see if there's something else I want to read to you here. But it has to do, I want you, if you don't get anything else out of this, I want you to understand. The fact that something exists means there's something behind it. That's the point. The fact that faith exists means there's something behind it. There is a foundation. Faith is the foundation of which we build the house of God. And the house of God, which is us, is built by walking in the commandments of God. And that has, that's one of the things, that's the last thing that has to be added to your faith, which is charity, which is agape. You have to add the word of God do you add this word all of a sudden? No. Let me give you a, <clears throat> some verses on hypostasis. I'm not getting much to predestination this morning, but the fact that God preordained everything in an exact fashion means that you have to study more than you think you have to study in order to understand. <clears throat> I've been studying the Bible for about 58 years, and I have learned. Those people didn't think like we think. I've learned that simply from studying. They didn't think like we think. They didn't talk like we talk. They certainly didn't have the same language we had. And that was 2,000 years ago, another culture, another idea, another attitude. So if you're going to study the Bible, use your concordance. If you don't use anything else, look up the words as you go. Now, let me give you a couple other things, and then we'll get back to this Luke 14. Look over here. I want to show you some other words about hypostasis. Look here in 2 Corinthians 9. I've been meaning to do this for a long time. 2 Corinthians 9, and we'll come back over here. I'm going to give you a few places this word hypostasis. 
so you can think, understand. The fact that you can see something going on. If you see a man building the house of God by walking the commandments of God, you will know that he has a substance. You'll know the faith is there because of what's going on in his life. That's why I say Tom Cruise cannot be a believer because I don't see any daily cross and death to self and I don't see him walking in the commandments of God. The Bible says we'll know people by the fruits that they bear and they have no fruit. You forget it. Somewhere in your life you have to be bearing the fruit of the Spirit, don't you? Now look here in Second Corinthians 9. Now, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, these are the benevolent chapters. These are chapters that were written by Paul, and these chapters are about Titus coming to Corinth with offerings from Macedonia. Macedonia was Thessalonica, or the book of Thessalonians were written to them, and Philippi, that was Macedon. The Macedon was the northern section of, of Greece. That's where Alexander the Great come from. Northern Greece was called Macedon or Macedonia. And the Macedon Empire was led by Alexander the Great. Now Alexander the Great is always considered a great general, but to be a, a wasp in the ancient world, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, <laughs> you had to be from southern Greece. You had to be from Athens and where they had all their brilliant God worship and philosophers down here. If you were from Macedonia or Macedon, you were considered a redneck. Alexander the Great, by the standards of the day, would have been considered a redneck because he was Macedon. And Macedonia, when Paul says, I heard the call from Macedonia, come over and help us, he was over here in Troas. When he says he heard that, Macedonia was considered the churches of Philippi and Thessalonica. They're up here in the northern section of the GNC. There's a little thing that looks like a hand with three fingers there. That is where Philippi and Thessalonica were. Now, look here. So, he says here in this 8th chapter, he says, Titus went to Macedonia and he's bringing offerings to Corinth, but Corinth has never supported the work here. They ought to be ashamed of themselves. Now, these two chapters, even when you find, when you find God loves a cheerful giver here in this ninth chapter, cheerful is not hilarious. It means one who gives from his heart. The word hilarious comes from that's the word hilaros. It means happy giver, not ha-ha-ha-ha giver. You know, that's not what he's talking about. It means a happy giver to the poor. And when the Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver, he's talking about giving to the poor and the needy. These chapters are not about the tithe. Don't think that. These are, don't use that verse. God wants you to give cheerfully whatever you want to give. He really wants you to tithe is what he wants you to do. And if you don't have that conviction yet, don't do it until God beats you, okay? Now, he says here in chapter 9, well, what did I do with my paper? Here it is. 2 Corinthians 9. Now read here a little with me. Verse 3, Yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that, as I said, ye may be ready. Lest happily, if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we that we say not ye shall be ashamed in this confident boasting. That word confident is the word hypostasis. It means your understanding of boasting is what it means. And look over here in... 11 and 17s, 11, 17. He's talking about not boasting in the things of this world, but only in God. 11 and 17. Paul is talking about false teachers here. He just got through talking about that these false 
this, these false teachers have transformed themselves into angel of lights, angels of light, and transformed is the word metaschematizo, M-E-T-A, S-C-H-E-M-A-T-I-Z-O, means to disguise oneself. And he's saying these guys have disguised themselves as preachers of righteousness. In verse 17, well, let's read on down to 17. Uh, verse 15, Therefore it is no great thing if the ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness. These are false teachers that have disguised themselves as ministers of truth, whose end shall be according to their works. I say again, let no man think me a fool, if otherwise yet as a fool receive me, that I may boast myself a little. Now Paul is saying, I'm going to boast a little the way men boast, but I'm going to speak foolishly. That which I speak, I speak it after the Lord, but I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly, in this confidence of boasting, that word confidence is the word hypostasis. He said, I'm saying this in an understanding of boasting so you will understand that I, if anybody had a right to boast, it would be me. Because he goes on to say down uh, in verse 21, I speak as concerning reproach as though we had been weak, how a bit, wherein soever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I'm bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they of the seed of Abraham? So am I. He says, I have an understanding to boast if a man actually boasted in the flesh, but nobody has a right to do that, so I'm going to talk like a fool and speak like these false teachers speak that are coming here. And look over here in Hebrews 1. Now here's a real good place for the, hupo, the word hupostasis. <coughs> Hebrews... I didn't know I was going to get into hypostasis today, but I, it, it's actually basically faith is the substance, the evidence of things not seen. What you don't see is the foundation until you see men working and adding to their faith and increasing their faith by building the house of God. You don't build the house of God, which is you, the day you start believing, do you? It's not built that day. It's built by faith in faith increases and works by agape. And agape is walking in the commandments of God. And that's what edifies or builds up oikodomeo. Oikodomeo, remember O-I-K-O-D-O-M-E is the word building. Oikodomeo is the verb form. It means to build or edify the house of God and build upon faith. That's how faith increases is by adding seven things to your faith there in Second Peter 1 and 5. That's the building of the house of God. Can you see that? It's not as hard as you think. Now look here. Now just think of understanding when you read this. Let's read here in Hebrews 1. Uh... In verse 1, God who at sundry times in divers manners, divers, we use the word diverse, just put an E on the end of it, D-I-V-E-R-S-E. Divers means various kinds. And sundry means uh, many portions. Those of you that are old, like me, you remember in the early 50s, or like 1949, 50, you drive by a drugstore, it would, say, it would say sundries. That's an old Greek word. Sundries means various portions of different things. You can buy any number of things here. That's what it meant. So sundry, sundry times in various kinds of manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days... The last days are here, but they were here back then, weren't they? Peter stood at Pentecost and said, This is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, that in the last days the Lord will pour out of his Spirit on all flesh. All flesh meant red, yellow, white, black, and brown flesh, or, every, or the Gentiles. That's what the all flesh was. Who being, uh, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. 
Well, Jesus made the worlds. The Bible says in the beginning was the Word. The Word's with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And the Bible says all things were made by Him, the Word. The Bible says that repeatedly. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That was Jesus. He made everything. Who being the brightness of God's glory. Now, anytime when you're studying, and you're studying the glory of God, the doxa, doxa means glory. When you're studying that, even when he, the Bible says we are his glory, we're only his glory because Christ is in us. When David said the heavens declare the glory of God, it's certainly speaking of Christ because what is the glory of God? That's Christ. Anytime you see glory, think of Christ. The only way we can be the glory of God is Christ has to be in us, right? And we don't put Christ in us. He puts Christ in us. And he who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his hypostasis. Christ is the very Character, the word express image is the word character, C-H-A-R-A-K-T-E-R. -A -A -E it is our word character. He is the very character, or he is the, the, the thing that has been graven. It's an image or a figure. He is the figure of God's under. Standing. The way we understand God is through Jesus Christ. He's the foundation of the Father in our lives, isn't he? That's what he's saying. He's the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he hath himself purged our sins, set down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So Christ is the very understanding of the personage of God. That's how we understand God is through Him and His words. Isn't that true? If you don't rightly divide the word of truth, it's wrong. Look here in Hebrews 3 and verse 14. Verse 14. For we are made partakers of Christ, and we hold the beginning of our hypostasis, confidence. We hold the beginning of our understanding. If you understand something, let me just ask you this. If you understand something, are you confident in that? I'm very confident in what I understand about the Bible. When I preach to somebody and talk to them, I'm very confident in my ability to understand what I'm talking about. But I've spent 58 years. Why shouldn't I? But it takes more than 58 years. It takes God giving you a special ability to understand. Doesn't it? So. Now. Let's go back. Well let me read the rest of this. We. What verse is I in? 14. We are made partakers of Christ, and we hold the beginning of our understanding steadfast unto the end. And we're going to hold our understanding to the end. When you start understanding something, do you get to where you can't understand it anymore? No. I mean, Gary flies planes. Do you forget how to fly? No. <laughs> Rusty was in karate. Have you forgotten all that? No, he hadn't forgotten it. You don't forget something you learn. So the fact that faith works. Wilt thou know vain man that faith without works is dead? You're not saved by works, but you're saved by God working in you. God working in you is where he causes the house of God, which is you, to be built upon faith. That's why faith has to grow. It has to increase by adding these things to the foundation. Now, now let's go over here to Hebrews 11 and verse 1. 
So that's not the first time this word's been mentioned, is it? We need to learn to look these words up wherever you find them. Now we see what this means. Now let's read it. Hebrews 11 and 1. Now faith is... Well, you really need to go to the previous chapter because you don't start off... You don't walk up to somebody and say, Now I want to tell you this concerning that. And you walk up to somebody and say, Now... And you start a conversation with now. They're going to say, now what? What do you mean now related to what? Well, it's related to the previous chapter. Gosh, I don't even know where to start. Look, verse 36. For you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. Now that's not a New Testament verse. That's a book verse out of Habakkuk. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. The writer is saying, which I believe is Paul, the writer is saying that it's possible for believers to draw back and pull away from truth, isn't it? Well, certainly we've seen that all through the Bible. David pulled away from truth and committed adultery and murder. And Moses pulled away and, and struck the rock twice. And God told him to speak to a rock. And you got all these men. And Saul pulled away from God. He drew away. But we are not of them who draw back into perdition. We don't draw completely back. Word perdition is apolia, A P O L E I A. A P O L E I A. It, it's a derivative word, A P O L L U M I, which is the word destruction. It's the word lost. Jesus came to seek and to say that was lost, perish. It's the word perish. It's a form of all those words. Then he says, we are not like them who draw back into perdition, but of them that believe in the saving of the soul. Now, now we go into this verse. Because the just shall live by faith. The just, or the dikaio, D-I-K-A-I-O-O, -O, that word dikaio means to render innocent. And the Bible says, can you see that in, John, in James, the second chapter, rendered innocent, can you see how man is justified by works and not by faith only? He's not saved by works. He's rendered innocent as people see him building the house of God, but it'll be God causing that house to be built as his faith is increased and as he adds to the foundation, which is the substance of the understanding, and that's what faith is. Faith is what we build on. That's what we start with, isn't it? That's what starts. You have little faith when it starts, and as you build the house of God and get the roof finished, you're an old man or an old woman. That's right. Little faith will save you. All, I mean, if somebody is a believer and they, and they are killed in a car wreck before their faith grows, well, they're going to go to heaven because they had little faith. Because it's the little faith that's the inner man and this body is the reason for the building of the house of God. We are God's building. We are God's house. That's this bodies we live in. Can you see that? We live in, this is the house of God. Well, this house needs to be built away from sin. Because everybody has sin in them. Sin is the transgression of the law. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Whatever doesn't work by agape is sin. Right? Now. Now faith is the substance, the hypostasis of things hoped for. It's the understanding of things hoped for. It is the evidence, faith, which is the understanding, which is the foundation. It's the evidence of things that we can't see. We can't see a man's faith, but we can see his works. 
we can see God working in him, not works for salvation, not works of self-righteousness, not ritual, but God working in a man and causing him to overcome self and changing him. Do you realize that building up this house of God that we live in is changing? It's God changing your attitudes about anger and rage and fury and getting angry and getting stressed out and I deserve my way. Nobody deserves their way. If the house of God is built in you, you're not just going to have this bare faith down here. That's not all you're going to have. You're going to learn to behave yourself. You're going to learn to quit stressing out and quit worrying because it's God that's building the house that you live in. And the house of these physical bodies we live in, it doesn't He live in us? Isn't Christ in you, the hope of glory? We are supposed to be learning these things so the house can be built up. It's a lot more fun living a Christian life, having the full house, than just having the foundation and somebody laid a few bricks there and read bricks and then they walked away. It's more fun having the whole house of God. Life is more enjoyable. Getting away from yourself because self is always stressing and worrying. I want my way. and We're not supposed to have our way. We're not even supposed to be stressing out with each other. When you do that, you've laid a few bricks and you've walked away. You say, I don't need any more of that. Yes, you do. You want to be content? You're going to have to build this house of God, but it won't be you that builds it. It'll be God that's building it, and faith will work by agape. And it, but you can't do that unless you're a... You've got to hate yourself. You've got to hate your mother, your father, your sister, your brother. That does, they got to hate the part that don't believe God, and the part that don't believe God is this outer man, isn't it? And this outer man has to be overtaken by God over a long period of time. The faith is there. That's the inner man. Then that man will be saved. But it's terrible. God says, I'm not going to have you living in this house being a harlot. A harlot is, he's talking about the harlot of Babylon who founded upon self or let us make us a name. He said, I'm not going to live with that. And I insist that you start behaving. You say, well, I've had enough. I've learned all I need to learn. No, you haven't. You had, I haven't learned all I need to learn. I'm learning constantly. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Evidence is the word elenkos, yearly G-C-H-O-S. I hope you're getting a hold of this. This seems to be a little deeper into uh, the broadness of Scripture. Let me erase this over here. I'll draw that building again if I need to. It's all clogged up with a bunch of chalk stuff. Yeah, all right. All right. I hope you're going to understand what substance is. Faith is two things. It's substance... Hypostasis. And the reason you can understand is because there's a substance there. There's something that people see in you, and that's Christ working in you. And they're supposed to see Christ working in you. If he works in you to build up the house of God, he's going to put down the old house, the old man. And that takes a long time for tribulation and trials to work in us it's substance and it's evidence evidence is the word elegos e-l-e-g-c-h-o-s elegos it's the same thing it's the basic same word as e-l-e-g-c-h-o this word means to rebuke so this would be the verb, and this would be the noun. Evidence is a noun. The evidence, when you go into a courtroom, and what convicts the man is the, the gun down there on the table with his fingerprints on it, and, and the fact that somebody saw him shoot the guy, and the smoke's come out of the, out of the barrel. Or it's a knife down there with blood on it, his blood and the blood of his victim, and that's on the evidence table, and that's the evidence. There's evidence. Faith is evidence. Faith is is God rebuking this, I'll draw it like this, this outer man 
building and saying, this man has to go and I'm going to replace him with this real building, spiritual building. And it has to grow. It has to increase. If it doesn't increase, you do not know God. If the house is not being built, it's not built one day. It's built over a long period of time. If, if agape builds up the house of God, and agape is walking in the commandments of God, do you learn to walk in God's commandments all of a sudden when you become a believer at 16 years old? No, you don't learn to become a... You don't walk in the commandments all of a sudden. Didn't anybody learn to walk in all the commandments of God at 25? How about 35? How about 45, 55, 65, 75? You don't learn all that one day. That is how God's house is built up. Now, let's go back to the 14th chapter. We're talking about what does it cost to believe predestination? Prohorizo is the word predestinate. Whether anybody likes it or not, that's the word. God is predestined. He's predetermined. Pro before, determined for the horizon. Horizo is our word horizon. And that's where the light shines. God has predetermined His people for light. Now, whether you like that or not, that's the definition. The people God foreknew, whom He did foreknow, He's predestined to be conformed. What would you call that in relationship to this message this morning? To the image of Christ. Or to the icon. What if I said to the understanding? What if I said to the hypostasis? Image. E-I-K-O-N. The likeness of Jesus is the building of the house of God upon faith. That's what it is. There's the understanding. There's the foundation. You have to build up the house of God. God has to do it in you. This is not something you have to do. It's something God's going to do to all of His people. You're going to get up fighting and self and give up your arguing and give up your... He's going to say, I insist that you be like Jesus. Do you know that's how I approach people like to be like Jesus? It took God a long time to teach me that. Because I wasn't this way 20 years ago. When people give me a hard time, I say, okay. And I know their mind is set. I say, well, okay, if that's what you want. I have to go now. I leave them alone. I leave them alone while they wallow in their opinions. Their opinions is their imagination. The world lives in an imagination. I was going to go into that this morning. Maybe I'll go into it next Sunday morning. Now, Go back to Luke. It takes a lot to give up, to give away that old man, that false man, and build this house of God. It takes a lot. It takes giving up everything that you want. But I want that. I want that house. I want that car. I want him. I want her. I want, I want, I want. Until God takes the I want away from you and say, Lord, whatever you would have me to have. That's the idea of tokos, the word poor in spirit. It means to be emptied out like a beggar with a hand out and saying, Lord, whatever you want me to have. Until God brings you to that instead of, but I want, I got this false house that I've got here and I want to fulfill it. God says, get rid of that and I want you to build this real house a little at a time on the foundation of faith and that will be built by agape but you won't walk in the commandments if you notice all my messages are about the same thing you won't walk in my commandments until i put you through enough tribulation and fire and trials and i'm going to make you surrender to me you're going to come out with your hands in the air say i give up lord has god done that to anybody besides me made you throw your hands in there and say i surrender i'm gonna quit living for myself he has to bring you to a place saying, I, I surrender. I, I lived for Jim Brown the first 44, 45 years of my life as a believer. Then after God got a hold of him, he stuck me in the hospital and started killing me. I said, okay, God, I'll do it your way. And do you know that his way is the most contentment I've ever had in my life? I've never had this kind of contentment. I'm old and 
and I'm wore out, and I don't care, and I'm not going to get angry at nobody. I'm not even going to get angry at the people that get angry at me and tell me off. It's a waste of time, isn't it? I'm not going to get angry at people that do me wrong. I say they're supposed to be that way. And sometimes you think people are doing you wrong because of your imagination. Quit imagining things and wearing your feelings on your sleeve and saying, that's not like Christ, is it? you got to allow people to do whatever they want to do. You, do you know that you can control people and God makes you like a king when you start living like Jesus? Do you know you can actually control people with gentle, kind words, with godliness? When you start getting godly with everybody, they start backing away. Oh, man, he won't fight me. Not only that, he says these things like he loves me. And he, I said this the other day. I said it to Dave. I said, when people start giving you a hard time and they're believers in the church and they say something really irrational, really ratty, reach out and say, man, I love you. I, I wouldn't hurt you at all. Do you know that makes people melt? while they're yelling at you. They go, Ugh. they don't know what to do. Because the world doesn't respond that way, do they? I'm not saying hug the guy at work or your boss. I'm talking about a person that's a believer. And you know they're a believer and they're having a hard time with their temper and they lose their... T we got several people in here that lose their temper and blow up like an atomic warhead. Did you know that? Did you know me and Mary used to do that? We don't do that now. Don't you Yeah. <laughs> but the only reason tempers explode is because of pride in self and you're living in that old building. And this new building has to be built and you have to learn to give up self a little at a time and that's what we're predestined to is to be like Jesus. We're predestined to conform to His image, aren't we? That's what predestination is all about. It's everything I've been reading here. How much time do I have, Mike? Well, let's go back to the 14th chapter because there's a verse here of Luke. Predestination is about everything that I've put up on the board. It's if, if God doesn't put faith in your heart, you're not going to have it. If God doesn't make faith grow, if He doesn't increase your faith, you're not going to build the building of God and you'll sit around with your opinion and your imagination, imagining things out of the Bible and imagining things from people, thinking, I am imagine. I think that person don't like me and I think I've got all the truth with all my imagination. Stop your imagination. Do you realize that imagination is the first result of Babylon? The Bible says that Babylon was the mother of harlots in Revelation 17 and 5, and she was founded upon, let me make me a name. Let me make me an authority with my wife, my husband. Let Name is the word shim. It means authority. I'll make me an authority. And as soon as a person says that, the Bible says, now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Once you say, I am the authority in my household, in my life, with God, with my wife, with my kids, the Bible says your imagination goes wild. That's why you think people are out to get you. People are not out to get you. They're out to get ahead no matter who they have to hurt. And it's not just you. It has nothing to do with you. It has to do with the world. It's the way the world is. We're predestined to be like Jesus and build this house of God by walking in His commandments, but you, man is unwilling to do that because there's none that understandeth. There's none that hypostasis. Nobody understands. And the only thing that will make you understand if God begins to build that house, you say, I don't understand. Well, the reason you don't is because if you have faith at all, it's just a little bitty... It's just a foundation. You hadn't built anything on it. And nobody can see Christ in you until that house starts to be built. And the more, the closer it comes to the roof, that's why they said a house was finished when the domain was up. 
domain is the word roof. Oikos, house roof. When the roof is finished, but don't lay a little bitty bit of brick and walk away. I have done that, haven't most of you here? I've walked away after I got a few bricks laid and think, I'm smart. No, you're not. Now look here in Luke. Luke, the 14th chapter. Let's read the rest of this. Now notice he said, you can't be a learner until you hate your mother, father, sister, brother, and yourself that makes excuse for not believing God and not eating of His Word. And then he says, verse 29, count the cost in verse 28. It's, going, it's costly. Lest happily after he hath laid the understanding, the foundation, and is not able to finish it, well, you can't finish this if you're trying to finish that by your own works. All that behold begin to mock him. You start off as a believer and you have faith and you decide to go out and drink a little and you decide to cuss a little and people say, I thought, hey, I wouldn't knew you were this Christian. Saying, this man began to build and he wasn't able to finish the work. Or what king goes to make war against another king and sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he is able by 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? We're like an army. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil for we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take ye the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins going about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. This is a war. And take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. We're in a war, aren't we? And we're trying to build this house of God, but we can't do it. God has to build it by putting us through tribulation and fire and saying... I want you to live like my son Jesus. Don't get involved in all these fights and fusses and imaginary things that you get involved in. Uh, they don't like me and they're trying to do me in. And she and he and they and baloney. Forget all that stuff. We're supposed to be like Jesus. Did he go around getting mad at everybody? No. Only the Pharisees, the lying false teachers, he didn't have the... He was compassionate to the apostles, even when Peter denied him. When Peter said, Oh, I've been far from thee, Lord. You're not going to go and be crucified. And Jesus said, Peter, before the cock crows twice, you'll deny me three times. Satan has desired you that he may sift you as wheat. Peter, you... I love you, Peter. Jesus didn't hate Peter for denying him. You have to, we have to be like Christ. That's what we're predestined to. Or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage, an ambassador, and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, look at verse 33. Put a great big circle around this. Whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he has cannot be my disciple, you got to give up all your opinions, your imagination in order to build the house of God on the mathematics of God. Here's the rule book right here. Here's the axioms and the postulates and the theorems right here. You got to go by this, don't you? This is it. And if you go by this, you're going to stop the fussing and the fighting and the imagination. And We have a lot of people imagine things against each other here. If somebody, we, you use this term, but you don't believe it. He's punished us less than our iniquities deserve. Yeah, but I'll tell you what, he, if he does this to me again. I thought you said he's using that person to punish you. 
Or maybe it's just your imagination. He's using your imagination to punish you less than your iniquity is deserving. You think this person's out there to get you. I don't believe anybody in this church is out to get me. But do people hear gossip about me? Oh, yeah. And you know how much attention I pay to that? As if you went on the farthest end of this parking lot and poured some water out on the ground. And somebody come and said, Jim, Jim, he, uh, they went out there, Fred went out there and poured some water on the ground. I said, he did. I said, interesting. That's how much attention I pay to what people say about me. Because I believe everybody here loves me. And I love each one of you, and I can get along with everybody here. I can move in and live in a house with anybody, everybody in this room. You know why? Because of the attitude that's in me. If you want people to change towards you, change toward them. Be godly and Christ-like to the believers, and they'll follow you like little baby lambs. Did you know that? Because they're always looking for somebody. Other sheep are looking for somebody that can help them learn. And they're looking for somebody to help lead them. Do you know sometimes when people are fussing at you, they're just looking for an answer? Yeah, have you figured that out yet? It's all they're looking for. Some of you here have gotten mad and yelled at me, and I've reached out and grabbed you and hugged you, and you go, melt. <laughs> but see, I really do mean that, and you know I mean that. Unless you forsake everything you have. Well, that goes with verse 26 and 27, doesn't it? Hating your mother, father, sister, brother, you can't be my disciple. Taking your cross, or you can't be my disciple. And forsaking all you have, or you can't be my disciple. You cannot learn the word. Salt is good. But if the salt has lost his savor, well, if we're, salt, if we're the salt of the earth, and the word savor is the word moreno, here's how you lose all you have. Here's what happens when you lose all you have. M-O-R-A-I-N-O. It comes from the word morose, which means an empty-headed simpleton. What you have to, when you forsake all that you have, and you give up self, and you take your cross, the world is going to say you are a moron. We've got to look like morons, moros, morenos. That's what we've got to look like in, in the eyes of the people. But see, that's what happens when we start building the house of God instead of building the false house, this house of the flesh. Am I out of time? Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. God, help us to understand this book. It is so... Your word is so magnificent and it's so overwhelming to us, Lord. Help us to think like they thought back 2,000 years ago in another world. Help us to read the Bible and study it. I pray for the flock that they'll mature by adding and increasing their faith, Lord, and building upon this foundation of faith. Adding all these things we have to add. We'll praise and glorify you for all things. Lead us to your elect in Christ's name. Amen. Boy, I didn't know I was going there. Lordy, mercy. Huh? Oh, yeah, the book of James? Yes, definitely. Yes. There's so much to say on that. Oops. Yeah. We got into that, and then you got 
sidetracked with somebody else? Or we never well, I've, I've had these very notes for several years, and I just haven't taken time to go through it. That was good, wasn't it? Yeah, well, see, that was the, that was the point I was trying to make as I went through understanding. I said, that word is not used for understanding.